Hello and welcome to this evening's broadcast, podcast, or whatever kind of video cast you want to call us tonight. Uh, but what we have today is some very special guests with Rick Hall, who is the CEO of Agenity. Uh, and what you're going to find out from Rick is that he has been a serial entrepreneur and he's delving into this world of big data and really taking this concept of analytics to the next level as an enabler for many, many companies that are out there. Uh, with that, we also have our normal co-host, Jeremy Murdishaw from Fortify and Chris Jordan from Fluency Security. So with that, gentlemen, Jeremy, why don't you kick us off with what uh, alcohol you've brought this evening, sir? Me? Yeah, sure. you know, kick it off, bro. All right, here we go. I got two. Um, and they are on both ends of the spectrum. So this first one is uh, from a local brewing company called Firestone. This is a Flyjack Hazy IPA. It's 96 calories. Okay. Yes, you sacrifice a little bit on the uh, the alcohol percentage, but when you drink beer and do podcasts, you tend to get a little bit bloated. So this is a good <laughs> crisp, crisp beer. But because I'm a glutton for punishment, I've also got uh, something called Dragon's Milk. Oh yeah. And this is a a bourbon barreled aged stout. It's eleven and a half percent. So I'm making between the two, and they kind of even themselves out. It's a, it's a nitro stout, right? Yeah, this is amazing. By the yeah, way. sweet. That is good stuff. I've had it. I like it. All right, Chris, go ahead and show. I don't. I didn't bring the milk set, but I got a the Joy Theory. Now this is the next one of my trainer. Actually, I gave him a couple of these. He really appreciated. This is God is an American hazy IPA. It's probably got ninety six in the first sip. I don't even want to see the number on that one. And then, so normally with Rocket Fly, I, I like Angry Alice, but I'm going to go with. Uh, I'm going to try this uh, Serpent with the Alien, and we're going to see how Rock and Frog does on that one. Uh, that's an, another hazy Indian ale. So I'm, um, the only difference is, you know, the Imperial versus are straight up regular hazy. So we're going to see what, to, I'll, I'm going to find out what the difference is. Nice. So uh, Rick, now you're, you're not a beer drinker. You're going to be drinking. Uh, you know, I've got a bourbon. So I've got a Breckenridge bourbon, local Colorado. I'm up in the mountains and, uh, you know, I like that. Uh, the great thing about a bourbon is it, I won't be bloated, but maybe by the end of the podcast, I'll fall off the chair. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all good. And I kind of like the brown, uh, the brown liquid, right? So that's, uh, that's no tequila, no gin, not a gin guy, not a tequila guy, nothing wrong with the English or the, you know, others, right? They all have their drink, but I'm kind of a bourbon guy. There you go. All right. And so this evening, I have had the opportunity to go shopping and managed to find, though there's not much where I live out in the boonies, uh, I did find some Alaskan uh, IPA. It's Ice Bay uh, IPA. And uh, I, unlike everybody else, will only have one can of this throughout the show, whereas Jeremy and Chris may go back for three or four, depending on <laughs> <laughs> the potency of it. <laughs> All right. So with that, uh, introductions there. So Rick. If you could spend a few moments and just tell us about yourself and your company and, and what you do, please. Yeah, sure. So, you know, so I, as you guys have mentioned, I'm the CEO of Agenity. Uh, I've been in the analytics space for, for my whole career, kind of a long time. Uh, kind of got there by accident because in, in college, you know, I couldn't really uh, write well. So I had to type and the only way I could type effectively was to do it on a computer. And that kind of got me interested in software, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, out of college, started doing a little bit of consulting uh, for a little software company, and that kind of led to 10 years doing consulting database kind of work. And uh, uh, we were working in the telecommunication space where we started to deal with bigger and bigger data sets, which got me interested in analytics and BI. And I uh, got invited based on that to sit on an advisory board for Microsoft and their BI practice. And that led to a whole bunch of other things. I started a company called G4 Analytics, uh, sold that to Nielsen in 2012, uh, went on to be the, uh, the head of their sales analytics division and did that for about uh, five years and kind of realized I wanted to get back out and try something new. Uh, took a CTO role for a, a big retail services company called Acosta. Uh, you know, kind of enjoyed that, had a had an interesting time, but they were going through a few changes and I wanted to get back to a startup. So I uh, formed a company called Karen, which eventually led to the acquisition of Agenity. Uh, and uh, we're building what we think is the user experience for 
uh, for analytics for uh, for companies of, of many sizes and, and having a good time doing that. Awesome. So um, as you take a look at some of your history now, I understand that you used to live in the D.C. area before you moved to Colorado. Yeah, I did. So I lived in Bethesda, Maryland for uh, 15 years uh, and uh, uh, but ended up, uh, you know, I, I actually went to college in New Mexico and uh, always had an affection for the West. So we've been coming out here for years and years, and I had an opportunity to uh, uh, to get a place here and, you know, kind of uh, realize this last year and all the craziness that uh, uh, maybe I could actually be here uh, more permanently. And and so so here I am in Colorado. How did it go? I mean, so you're in Colorado now. Is your the rest of the company in Colorado? Are you guys spread out? How's the how's the startup world doing? We are spread across nine time zones wow. from Silicon Valley to Central Europe. And you know, we uh, uh, we came together, bought, did the acquisition on March 10th. So uh, as you can imagine, the country locked down uh, four days after that. So I've got a team. The, where the leadership team has actually never been in the same room together. Wow. Uh, and we run the whole company on Zoom. Uh, and, you know, I got to tell you, it's it's working great. Right. Right. Nice. Now, are you using, just out of curiosity, what other, what other platforms are you guys using besides Zoom? Are you using for communication? Are you guys using Slack or Teams? or? Uh, we use a whole lot of Slack. Uh, right. You know, we use Teams because, you know, we have clients who use Teams and sometimes we get on other things. Our kind of, stuff is it zoom and slack are probably you know kind of and then all the other usual stuff of email and our own software and all that but uh you know the, i i would say slack and zoom are kind of the infrastructure of communications in the company so i'm a, I'm a little intrigued by some uh, comments i read on your website and the one that intrigues me here is the world's only integrated analytics management solution Please do help me understand what that means. Yeah. So, you know, kind of, I, I think we're in what I think I'm starting to call the third phase of analytics, right? So, you know, you had kind of, let's call it early computing. We don't need to worry about when, what that was, but, you know, kind of starting in the 90s, you had the emergence of, let's call it central centralized analytics or data warehousing, right? So, you know, companies were building these large internal centralized infrastructures to manage their their analytic world and it was great for you know kind of big corporate processes right so if you're trying to you know do supply chain optimization or finance calculations it's all great right but uh you know the world of business has many 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 uh diverse processes and company and kind of almost everybody can benefit from analytics uh and the big centralized approach just can't deliver anything fast enough uh, or with enough variation to support all the nooks and crannies of a business. So, you know, kind of the, the way we're in now, which is enabled by these new analytic platforms like, you know, Snowflake and uh, Redshift and, you know, uh, uh, Hive, et cetera, is allowing these things to kind of scale out and do lots and lots of jobs. But where do you manage the calculation infrastructure? Uh, you know, where do you keep a common definition of, you know, the sales ROI calculation, uh, you know, we provide the layer where business users who are not technical can collaborate with the analytics team uh, in a way that's not driven by some centralized uh, process. And we call that analytic management, which is, you know, kind of a term that others don't use, which is, you know, kind of why we're the only ones that are doing it. Sure. So how do you define analytics for, so, so for the layman, you're, you, somebody's talking to you and they, you say, hey, I, I provide analytics. Are you going to, can you describe um, the way you view analytics? Is analytics just SQL? Is analytics uh, distribution or is the analytics machine learning? How do you yeah. describe analytics to a layman? So, so that's a good question. So I use the term analytics specifically not to say business intelligence or AI or machine learning, you know, because to me, it's all of that, right? It's, any use of data that creates some insight, uh, whether it's a human insight or a machine insight, whether it's standardized in a dashboard, just something I need to answer tomorrow, you know, it's an analytic. And, uh, and, and in all cases, uh, you have this kind of life cycle of getting data, cleaning it, integrating it, 
and calculating it. And kind of what we do is we make it easier to do those steps and for people who are both technical and non-technical to kind of collaborate in that, in that process. Um, and so we're, I'm not hung up on whether your analytic is a machine learning algorithm or, a, uh, you know, or it's a, a BI report. You need data. You need clean data. You probably need to do some basic calculations uh, on it before you do your advanced calculations. It's the un, unsexy engine room of getting, uh, you know, kind of analytics done. Uh, and uh, it's hard, right? Uh, <laughs> And we we try to make that easier. So when's a, when's a good time for business to call you? You know when when do I say, oh my gosh, I need to call you guys? So so you know kind of most companies today have some kind of analytic strategy, and there's somebody who's you know kind of a chief data officer or you know has responsibility for that, right? Um, and they're trying to figure out how to get all their data together, and maybe they've got one or more platforms. So they've got, you know, a corporate data warehouse and they're now trying to go to the cloud and they've got Redshift and they've got, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, and uh, maybe they had a very centralized process, but they got lots of users pounding on the door who need things. And they can't possibly keep up with them. Uh, we allow those teams to empower their users to do a lot more of this self-service, but to do that in a way that collaborates with the engineers. So it's not like take all the data off into Excel and do your own thing and then come back with an answer that nobody can understand uh, and is different than the answer of the guy in the other department who's trying to answer the same question, right? So it's kind of like this empowerment uh, strategy to broaden and democratize analytics in your organization, right? If you've just got one central analytic you wanna do, well, you're probably not living in the in today's world, but uh, if you do, then we're not for you, right? Okay. But if you're if you're trying to uh, support analytics throughout your organization, uh, and uh, you want to empower business teams, uh, and you want to do that uh, in a way that communicates and and works in harmony with your kind of central technology based team, then then. Uh, we might be somebody that you would want to look at. So, so it's a good time. So when we start doing analytics and it's just not from one source or one group of my company, that's when the diversity of my processes start occurring. That's when I have to say, you know what? I better start managing this before it becomes spaghetti. Is that yeah, and, and everybody's, that? everybody's got that situation, right? I mean, I don't think anybody's got one central integrated source of data that answers all the questions in their business. If there is somebody like that, I haven't met them right and oh, we just have quinn work. we just call quinn and we say quinn can you answer this for me he knows sure. everybody's got a quinn yeah <laughs> so, so quinn probably needs our tooling you know <laughs> to do all that magic you know to make it all easy for you right uh yeah. and uh but he has to you know it's it's like here's a really interesting example right you know i in my previous company uh we did a lot of work for consumer goods and retailers and uh uh, you know, the, the, the retail world is, is highly analytic driven, right? So the price of, you know, a product on the shelf, it's driven by a model that calculates the comparison of one price versus another price and the impact on sales and all that. And we used to build all those models and make all those analytics. And that's all great. And, you know, a year ago, you're the head of sales for a big consumer goods company. You got all this analytic infrastructure, right? Well, along comes COVID mm. and it changes everything, right? You know, kind of, the demand for your products changes, where they're bought, how they're bought, everything is different, right? And maybe even in different regions, depending on how much COVID there is and what's going on with testing and what the rules are, is different, right? So, you know, you're the head of sales, you turn to your head of technology and say, hey, look, can you update all these sales analytic models with the data on what's happening with COVID? And, and you know, and she turns back to you and says, yeah, absolutely. I'll have you an answer in nine months, right? And and you're like, well, I got to stock the stores next week. And so yeah. So what do you do? You turn to uh, some poor person on your team who has a a you know maybe a business degree, happens to be good with Excel, and you say, look, go get the data uh, on what the heck is happening in the world and 
figure out what's going on with our sales and mix it with our corporate data. And they go off today, in today's world, and they grab all this data and they munge it around in Excel on their own, on their desktop, and try to answer the question, right? And, you know, there are tens of thousands of those people, right? Uh, so first of all, every consumer goods company working with every retailer has those people who have done exactly what I just said over the last nine months, because all of their models completely went out the window, but they had to keep running their business. And so they had to, you know, they did all these things on their own, on the, by hand, right? So we need to take those people and allow them to be empowered to work with our corporate data and to do that in a collaborative way. And that's what we're focused on, like the speed of analytics, the diversification of analytics, the democratization is critical to having analytics work in a business in a world that's changing. And let's face it, our world is changing all the time, right? You bring up a really interesting point because when I first started talking to you, my brain was working on diversity of, of data sets, right? Snowflake versus Amazon versus ClickHouse, you name it. Right yeah. now, you're bringing up a very important point for people like Jeremy and I, which is the models. So one reason why data analytics normally fails in our industry, which is security, is because the adversary changes their techniques and tactics so fast that the models become obsolete very quickly. Yeah. So you're saying that good management of analytics is not just the collection and normalization of the data, but the ability to swap the models out. Like you guys can handle like, oh, I'm going to move from a uniform distribution to a, a standard deviation and the standard deviation, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z. I mean, that's, that's you guys help manage that in the analytics? Yeah, so we, we empower people to handle that diversity, right? Okay. Um, you know, because the 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 one you know the one super clean model that does anything right it is great for about five minutes in the world of business today, right? Because you know security, you're dealing with new threats all the time. There might be new data sources that you need to you know address when you're trying to figure out what's happening. Uh, and uh, you know the COVID example, uh, or if you think about you know you know the the tariff structure changed everything you know, in a bunch of industries, you can go on and on and on and think about how much is changing. And, you know, kind of the, the centralized, highly managed, highly structured analytic models, they just can't keep up with that change. I mean, they're great for the industrial processes, but if you got one person who's acquiring the data and they're putting it in one place and structured to answer one question, and, you know, then it goes through step A, B, C, D before it gets to an answer, uh, you know, it's pretty hard for that world to react to change yeah. and, to, and to diversity, right? So I would say the big, the, you know, data is exploding, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people have, we, we've all come to realize that, you know, that analytics can help us make decisions about kind of almost everything. Yeah. But, you know, but, you know, centralized systems can't possibly keep up. So, so, uh, so you're looking at it though, Right. Just to think of it this way. So you're going down this road. Uh, one thing I'm trying to catch up in my brain, because I'm not a business analytics or a BI, business intelligence yep. kind of guy. Now, you have years after years, you, you have to forget stuff to put new stuff in. You probably know so much on this stuff. So can you give me like a, a history of business analytics and analytics in general? Obviously, your company, you're seeing something in the future. Yeah, I'm not saying you're betting the house because it's a nice house and I don't want to think you're going to lose the house you have right now, but you're seeing something as the industry is changing. Yeah. Let us in on the secret. What are you seeing in the industry that you're saying, oh my God, people are not seeing this right now? So so it, it, it is around this diversity, right? And the centralized world in the past. So the way technology worked uh, in kind of what I call the second phase, the centralized data warehouse world is that there was a group in, in IT, they collected the data, they put it in a data warehouse, they built the calculations and they served up the answers to the business, right? And that, that, that centralized model of how analytics was done had, it supported a lot of good decisions and a lot of great things that happened that way. But it's been very difficult for that to react. What we're seeing now is we have customers that want that have thousands of people in the business that they want to allow those thousands of people to ingest their own to bring in their own data data they have into 
this corporate data architecture and mix that data with other things. And I got to tell you, when I was managing a central data warehouse, there is no way we would ever let those business people touch our central data warehouse with their data. Like, no way. Forget it, right? You can't put your data in here and you can't mix your data with our data. So what did they do? They took the data that we had, they put it on their desktop, they took their own data that they still had, they used Excel or some other local thing, access database or you name it, mm -hmm. to try to come up with an answer. And they weren't technical people, they were maybe great Excel people and they knew something about the business. So they, they did get to answers, but they made a lot of mistakes and nobody could see what their process really looked like. Right. But we kept our priesthood of the central data warehouse clean and secure, uh, but we never answered all their diverse questions, right? So today, what we're seeing is companies who want to empower their uh, downstream business people to be able to do this themselves, right? Because they realize they can't possibly keep up, right? So. You know, I was on the uh, on a call with the chief analytics officer, of one of the biggest healthcare companies in the world. And he's like, "Look, I have two thousand analytics people in my organization. Seems like a lot, right? I have forty thousand people in the business who all have different needs. I can't keep up with them. I need something that allows me to allow them to work." with our data and right. with the stuff my 2000 people do. So if the 2000 people can empower the 20, 30, 40, whatever thousand people in the business and they can collaborate, then I got something interesting. And, and, that, and, that's, what, and that's what we're, we're doing. Uh, and it's kind of really fun because uh, uh, it's a huge problem. People are really wanting to do this. Yeah. We see some of the, you know, the biggest, most sophisticated analytic companies in the world are doing this empowerment thing, uh, and uh, you know they they need uh, you know they need tools that are designed for empowerment. And most of the tooling uh, that has existed, that's grown up over the past fifteen or twenty years, has grown up to support the central you know kind of uh, you know world. Right now, are you seeing any issues if the data is located both on premise and in the cloud as people move more and more data to the cloud? Uh, <laughs> we're seeing clients who want both. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, one yeah. of the unique things about our technology is we talk to all kinds of different databases, whether they're on premise or in the cloud. Um, so we don't actually do any of the processing, by the way. So we leverage Redshift and Synapse and Hive and you know, uh, all these other, th these databases, these data platforms, they are built by the most sophisticated engineers on the planet, right? So you're not gonna out engineer Snowflake or Microsoft or Amazon when it comes to these data architectures. They've made these data problems scale and they can scale up and down really super quickly. Um, and it's really hard engineering that they've done, right? But, uh, they're focused on that hardcore processing engineering and their tooling is, is kind of basic and it's enough to do the job for engineers. We provide tooling that the engineers and the business people can use that drives the processing into the platforms. So these guys like us, right? We have a great relationship with these companies. Uh, as they release new features, we build them into our application so that business people can use them. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that helps us in terms of kind of growing our business and it helps them, and, you know, and hopefully it helps empower our customers. So Does that make sense? sense? Yeah. You ring the bells with you? <laughs> What's that? Well, Jeremy's I was doing, doing all the analytic stuff because we do a lot with cloud stuff. I mean, we're, yeah. I, I'll tell you that we're seeing a lot of movement a lot of companies began to trust the cloud a lot more, especially during COVID. Yeah. We're moving a lot of stuff to COVID. We're, we've seen a lot of a rise in AWS usage, uh, data store usage. Um, we just talked to somebody yesterday, Al and I did. I, I had to, I have three pages of notes of how many third party services are using their data is everywhere. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Right. 
I was just I was just thinking of the, all the stuff that we're working on. I was wondering if it ring any bells with Jeremy about what do you well, think? Well, it, it does. I mean, we have data, we have threat intelligence data that we collect on all these different systems that we have out there, the ones that we're managing for customers, our own systems. Bringing all that in, it's all in different formats. It's, you know, making all that normalized and bringing it into a usable way where the SOC team can look at the data and make sense of it with that, where you can, we can bring on analysts who might be newer and, and not have this, try to flatten that learning curve a little bit. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the analytics help that organizations like I need, right? right. I don't know if that's something that your tool can do uh, to help norm to help me with that. Yeah. Not. Yeah. It, it's, it's a very classic problem because, you know, uh, one of the things that you have, a lot of businesses have, particularly in the on the business side, they're bringing in new people all the time, right? So analysts, you know, people have the analyst hat, by the way. It's not like you can go out and say, give me all the data analysts in your company. Their titles are all over the place, right? They came to the job thinking they were going to do something else, and they got handed a problem says, go, you know, crank out this data, right? So, uh, the, the you know, so one requirement of empowering the business is this stuff has to be super easy and intuitive for somebody who's not technical to do, right? So, okay, if you're a programmer, you can write a, a SQL statement to ingest data into Redshift or Snowflake or whatever in about five minutes, right? But if you're a business person, that might be a really hard problem. So we give you a wizard to do it, right? Uh, you want to link that data to other data. Uh, you know, if you're a SQL programmer, it might be really dead easy if there's some kind of key to link them, right? But if you're a business person, that might be really hard. So we're going to give you a wizard to do that, right? So, but under the hood, it's going to be SQL. So uh, the 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 engineer who's your partner uh, can add the SQL, could change the SQL, mix the SQL with the stuff the wizard does, right? So it's that's the kind of world we're really trying to see and trying to support is that the technical people and the non-technical people, because, you know, like IBM did this study a couple of years ago. And they said, there's going to be a need for 2 million uh, data scientists in the U.S. by the year 2000, okay? And they're, and they're like, okay, but we produce 40,000 of them in the U.S. every year. So their answer is, we got to produce more. But well, they're, good, they're in China. Where, where, where is the math ever going to work out that you're going to go from 40,000 to 2 million, right? It's like, so the actual answer is, we got to power the 2 million people who are in the world doing these jobs uh, with capabilities that let them work with the 40,000 engineers. So like, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do. And, and Jeremy, to your point, Earlier, you said something that I think is really important about this world of change, right? You want to get all this data in and normalize it, right? Well, um, in the big historical world, you try to normalize it when you bring it in, right? In today's world, we want to bring it in whatever it looks like and then connect it for the question you're trying to answer. So we're not trying to pre-answer the analysis before you've even loaded the data. Um, and that's one of the things that's changed a lot about the paradigm of how these platforms work is you don't always know every question you're trying to answer on the data. That's so probably smoking something. Don't worry. You're probably going to write the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the two. Rick, you brought up the historical thing from IBM. And I, I about a decade ago, I remember as you know, big data was starting to become a common word and, and stuff. Uh, one of the problem statements was that, sure, you're collecting all this disparate data, putting it into this big database, but yet you're only getting about 20 to 23 percent real value out of that data. As you move forward to today and with tools such as yours, where would you say that percentage uh, meter is at in terms of being useful with the data? Well, I, I, I'm not sure I know the percentage, but I think one of the problems of that 23% you're talking about is goes back to that, you know, that discussion with Jeremy, right? Is you pre-calculated, pre-formatted the data when you brought it in, 
to answer the 23% of questions that you knew about, right? So now you, you know, so the next guy in, next woman in who answers has a different question. You're like, oh, well, we can't answer that question because we've already done this or that to the data, but we can reload the data for you, uh, put a request in the queue, uh, and we'll be back to you in X amount of time, right? And we'll preload the data for your new question, right? So one of the big advancements in the world of analytics is we've gotten away from that. We're not trying to pre-answer all the questions and pre-process the data to answer the questions. We're going to bring the data in natively. Now, that's a good thing, but that does then, it, just, it does move the problem of, of uh, how you do normalize it for a particular question downstream. And you got to make that easier for business people because then you run into the next problem is you don't have enough people who know how to link that data with other data or know how to process it for a calculation. So that's where you need, you know, kind of tools, you know, like ours uh, that are designed to empower more people in the business to answer more questions. Because if you don't pre, you know, if you pre-process the data, you're going to lose some fidelity no matter what. And if you lose some f- fidelity, you're gonna cut off your ability to answer some set of questions. It's just there's no way you're not going to. Um, that, that makes me think of you know the earlier discussion we had on COVID, right? Today I read an article that some uh, scientists in the UK figured out that these two new uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, if given early enough for a sick patient, right, really helps reduce that symptoms and impact. And I, I imagine that if we look at COVID on a broader scale. I think the ability of what you're saying here is you can work with all these different companies on a humanity level, right, to bring all of this disparate data and private data that they've collected to try to get some of the answers that might accelerate the solutions that we're looking for, not only with COVID, but anything else that might hit in the future. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to think that in any small way that we, you know, could contribute to helping on the, you know, the, the, you know, problems like COVID, right? But and more data, diverse data. Getting it, you know, kind of faster and empowering people is, is our game, and you know, kind of uh, that's uh, the the COVID world is is a great example of of our need to do that, right? Well, I so, want to ask some questions about entrepreneurship, and and what led you to the acquisition of Agenity, and and you know why? Yeah, so so I, first of all, I would say that I became an entrepreneur because nobody would ever give me the job that I thought I could do, right? You know, the, uh, uh, and I was stupid enough to think that I might be able to do it myself. And, uh, you know, it's been a great journey. I formed a couple of companies and that's been fun. Uh, so when I left, you know, Costa was I was CTO. I formed Karen, you know, we were kind of interested in a couple of things. So I actually brought a group of people together who were both on my board and, and part of my team to talk about what kind of company we wanted to form. And we, we set a set of, things that were about, uh, you know, what we knew about our passion, our ability to solve customer problems. And, you know, it wasn't like we're going to go solve X problem. It's like we're going to work together uh, on things that we know about. We had a fairly generalized idea. But there were two areas that we were really interested and passionate about. One was uh, about uh, teaching people how to productize uh, analytic applications. And that's kind of what I've been doing for a long time. And, uh, you know, that required just putting a training program together. So we were able to do that and launch that through Karen. And that's how Karen's business started. Uh, but we also started discovery on this problem of the analyst, right? So how to empower the analyst, because both at uh, my previous, at, you know, at, uh, at, at Acosta or at Nielsen, you know, we always had these thousands of analysts downstream from us, and we were trying to empower them. And it was kind of a difficult because we were doing the big central process and they were doing their own thing. And we were, you know, so we were kind of passionate about this issue. Uh, and uh, one of my partners is our chief product officer now, started to do some discovery around it and how to, how to do it. And uh, uh, in our training program, uh, the, the CEO of Nielsen, when I had been there, introduced me to a guy who was the CEO of this little company, Agenity. And Agenity had this model of analytics. And uh, 
they were going through some transition and, and kind of some up and down times where they had a big enterprise vision that they you know, had sold but not fully able to implement. They had a free tool that they'd given away. It had 30,000 users, was really popular. It was called Agenity Workbench. Uh, and, uh, and they realized that, well, you know, uh, this isn't working. What are we going to do? And, and I was, you know, fortunate enough to help advise them a little bit on saying, hey, it's the 30,000 people that you're delivering value for that you should be focused on. And how to create something for them that's valuable that they'll pay money for. Uh, and they started down this path, which became Agenity Pro, uh, which was launched uh, at the beginning of last year. Um, and, uh, uh, and I saw that as a foundation of what we needed for this broader analyst journey. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, kind of unbeknownst to them, uh, two thirds of their users started to become people in the business who were trying to query data, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they actually, they didn't plan to empower a bunch of business people because nobody in technology, no, but nobody, in, it was, I'm not blaming the agility people, like nobody in the world of tech and analytics was really trying to empower the end user that much, but they found that's what they were doing, right? And so we recognized, hey, you know, look, first of all, they built this incredible infrastructure to connect to all these data platforms. That's really hard, right? And they had done that in Launch Engine Pro, so they could generate SQL and talk to Redshift and Snowflake and, and all the SQL databases and, and Hive, which is not even really a SQL database. And you know, that is non-trivial engineering, and they had the infrastructure to do it. And they had this audience, 30,000 users, and a bunch of them were analysts. Now the analysts, and, and then, but they were also had an engineer. So 60% analysts, 25% engineers, and about 10% data scientists. And I said, like, that's the perfect audience for us. And they've got the infrastructure of the technology. So, uh, you know, I was fortunate uh, enough to have uh, a board uh, of investors who had supported me in my previous efforts. And I went back to them and said, look, you know, we can do something really special with what they've done. And, you know, we bring the, the passion for this collaborative problem to the table. They've got the infrastructure to do it. Uh, you know, let's put two and two together and, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, maybe we'll have to kind of put the training on hold for a while. Uh, maybe we can get somebody else to take that over later, but it'd be really cool to go do this because this is something that we can do and it's a really big need. So, you know, so we took the opportunity and we were able to put together a deal uh, and the owners of Agenity really liked our idea. Um, and the, the guy who was the CEO, Paul Sean, who'd been on the board and stayed on the board with us, he's been a super big help in making us through this transition. And, you know, uh, and the team, uh, their team, plus the kind of team that I bought, brought to the table, they're working together great, even though they've never been in the same room together, right? You know, uh, and they're, uh, they're, none of them are even in the, none of my direct reports are in the same time zone. Uh, uh -huh. And, uh, uh, and you know, so it, it, we've had 10,000 new subscribers to Agility Pro from March till the end of the year. Uh, and we've just got a whole and it's a bunch of, you know, some of the biggest companies that, you know, are out there and and some small ones. And, uh, uh, you know, in uh, Amazon, when they, you know, their, their reInvent conference, uh, they had some new features of their Redshift platform uh, that they wanted to demonstrate. They used our product to demonstrate it at reInvent a couple of weeks ago. That has generated a bunch of interest. So. So we feel super lucky, you know, in this crazy time, right? You know, uh, you know, this, this, uh, it's not a great time in the world for so much, but we're super lucky and, you know, kind of this Zoom empowered capability is great. Uh, and this transition is great. And, you know, kind of being able to take all the work that I've done over these years in this great team uh, and to try to help empower people uh, in getting analytics done right, you know, it's, it's a fun place to be. I feel super lucky.
Well, Rick, you brought up like three things that we think about often. You brought up pivoting. You brought up team, right? Team, the, the people you work with, the importance of that. We brought up focus of the customer, right? So we, we teach people to work with entrepreneurs, right? So I, I work with Virginia Tech. My wife works with GW, right? That, that, that There's so many universities right now trying to teach people how to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, you just after what you just talked about, I mean, when you think about, this is your second rodeo that we just talked about. Fourth, actually, but yeah. Fourth, right. So there's two that maybe we don't want to talk about. So the point is, is so, so as we go through this, what, what's the lessons learned? I mean, the importance of pivot, the importance of team. I mean, if you were to sit down with somebody just starting out and tell them, listen, I'm going to tell you what's about to happen. Yeah. This is about to happen. What would you tell them is about to happen? Besides the fact that they're going to continue to eat those ramen noodles and they're continuing to work over the weekends. Yeah. What is the other thing that you're going to tell them about, about being an entrepreneur? Yeah. So, so one thing is I do, I, I, I have a whole bunch of uh, young entrepreneurs I'm trying to advise because people advise me. And frankly, that was part of the original Karen vision. It's like, I thought I was going to go off into the sunset of my career, you know, just becoming an advisor. And I had an opportunity to do another rodeo and I took it because I love that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, um, you know, I think it's super important to, to give to back to that. So the first thing is when somebody tells me they should, if, if somebody asks me, should I be an entrepreneur? I almost always say no. Uh, and the reason is if you have to ask, uh, you probably, uh, you know, shouldn't do it. Right. Because, uh, you know, the thing about being an entrepreneur. It's just like marriage. If you have to ask. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, the one thing you've got to know is that chances are pretty good you're going to experience some tough times, right? And uh, everybody says, you know, in tough times, diversify, right? You know, you should all be diversified. Well, as an entrepreneur, you have to be able to bet you know, put all the cards on 21 red because you personally are 21 red, right? And if, if you don't have the mindset that says, this is what I'm willing to do, uh, then, you know, it's probably not a great idea. Um, but, you know, beyond that, I would say it, it's got to be, your motivation's got to be because you have a passion for the problem and the customer, right? And, uh, you know, uh, if you're lucky, you'll make money along the way. And I've been fortunate, but I've had some tough times and in some cases, a decade of them for one company. Uh, and a couple of times where I had to go a year or more without paying myself. Uh, and, uh, you know, but it's, you know, it, you've got to have passion for the customer, right? You got to focus on them. It's got to be about them, not about you. Uh, and, you know, that's the, that's the first thing. And then, then outside of the customer, you got to have passion for your team, right? Uh, because you're never going to be able to do it yourself. My example of uh, uh, Amazon and Redshift, right? And they did this new feature, and we were the only ones who had implemented their platform. Well, they had told us six months before their conference they were going to have this feature. And they, I suspect they told a dozen companies that, right? And we said we built it in our platform. And so did everybody else, right? But they didn't have the documentation ready to do the work till 10 days before the conference. Now, by then, a bunch of people had given up on it, right? Well, I never said anything to my team. They picked up the documentation. Mm -hmm. They worked through the weekend. They built the functionality. They had it working before the conference. And they did that without ever, you know, there was no executive uh, direction to do that. It was their passion for the problem. And I think you only get there if you have, you're only lucky enough to have a team that will do that if you're really passionate about yeah. that. Have right? a team of, with a sense of urgency. Alex. It's not just a sense of urgency. They just care that much about, yeah. you know, about what you're doing, that they're going to yeah. go do that without you asking them to do it or telling them to do it, right? Yeah, uh, they're fully engaged uh, in the company. 
So, yeah. so those are that's that's my little bit of entrepreneurial yeah. advice. I'm not well, sure it's all that useful, but you know, hey, look, I mean, I'm always willing to help people who want to do something fun and cool. Yeah, and Jeremy talked about Jeremy and I were talking about this. There's one more question I want to ask because it was for Hooper, like always. I, I, even though I have still a half more of my second beer to go, Jeremy and I were talking about this before. Is like so. So when I went to your website, you got that. Hey, if you're by yourself or it's a small team of five or less, hey, use this one. If not, give us a call. And so, how do you feel about and how do you look at the difference between small business selling versus a large business, and where do you prefer to be? I and mean, what's your strategy about the B2B versus the B2C? And where do you see that difference? I mean, how do you think of it? So, so, so what I think is really cool has been this emergence of, uh, you know, a freemium or land and expand model, right? Uh, which is what we follow. So ultimately, if a company truly adopts our software, we're selling to the chief analytics officer, or the chief data officer. But we don't get there because we called on them and they said, we said, we got the super cool thing for you. The way we get there most of the time is because we've got a piece of free software. If you're an analyst and you need to query a SQL database, you can go right now onto Agenity website. You can download Agenity Pro for free and you can start using it tomorrow. And we're super happy if you do, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, if enough of you at your company, start to use it, then, you know, we say, hey, you know, you should buy it more than five. But we probably don't call on you until you've got 100, right? That's a little secret truth there. Um, you're on an honor system. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but after you get enough of you using our software, you'll get a phone call from us. Say, hey, you know, uh, there's 100 of you guys using our stuff. Uh, you know, we think you should pay for it. Uh, and you uh, hit, before you go too far, Rick, you kind of hit something that kind of tweaked me. I, I think it's a good point, right? I mean, you know, because Al knows me, right? We've been working together now for the last couple of years. Anytime we use something, we never ask for anything free, right? I mean, we'll use free crap, but but we're not one of the people that if you sit around and say, oh, do we want to use a free version? No. If these guys are good enough, we'll pay them. I mean, how do you feel about that? Are you is that a is that a bone in your body where you say, you know what, I trust people. Or is it a bone in your body that just says it's a better business way of doing it? No, no. Look, if I if I didn't trust you, we wouldn't have a free software that you could download, right? Because like I can't control that completely, right? You know, there's going to be a lot of people who are using our software who aren't paying for it. Yeah. Uh, I know that. Uh, that's okay because the, the I mean we we would like you to pay for it. Uh, we'd like you to think you have enough value to pay for it. And by the way. The first product, I mean, it's only $100 a year for Pro, right? It's at $125. It's not that expensive. It's very inexpensive. We have a premium version, which is more expensive, you know, five or more times that. Uh, and you get lots of people that, you know, can add up. But the point of the business model I think you asked about is our model is premium and it's land and expand, right? So it's free. You use it. You get value. We hope you'll subscribe and pay for it. And we hope you'll tell other people in your company. Now you, you used it and have you used that model before? Or is this yeah. the first time you used it? This is the first time I've used it. Um, okay. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, I think it's the greatest model there is because uh, you're only selling to people who already know the value of your stuff. And there, there's a, it, you know, you, you're eliminating the kind of like, you know, used car salesman aspect of enterprise software, right? Like, unfortunately, you know, we went through a couple of decades of enterprise software. There's a lot of enterprise shelfware out there, right? Somebody at the C-level bought some system because they were convinced it would be great and no user would ever use it to get value. We never get above the individual if the individual doesn't actually like our stuff. That's I love that about our business model. Uh, and, and the other thing is it's a subscription. So you only, if you're not keeping getting value, you're not going to keep using it, right? So we have to align our value with the individual user and we have to align our value with the individual user over time. And if we do that right, that will lead to bigger and bigger yeah it's, it's, it's interesting I mean, you know because we're in the same boat same 
question that you're asking yourself, right? You want to make sure your users are using your product and they're happy with it, right? Yeah. So for Jeremy and I, I mean, obviously our cogs are too expensive to go away free, but like we constantly monitor our customers and say, are they using it, right? To tell you the truth, it's interesting you bring it up. It's not really, is it free? Is it paid? Is is it being used? I mean, that's our biggest question. Like when we see a customer not using it, we I tell you, we get angry inside. I mean, yeah, we, like, we get angry. We go, why aren't you using our crap? One but, of the things that, that I invested a lot in since yeah. we did the acquisition of Agenity is uh, in, in, internal analytics on the product, right? So we not only track usage, we track every feature usage. Not because we're trying to spy on people, but we're trying, trying to figure out which features have value, which features don't have value, how do we create more value. And we our, our product team is very focused on Who's using our, you know, our product and what value are they getting and what's their journey? Like, where do they abandon the software, right? They get 10 clicks in and they stop here. Why are they stopping there? That's a problem. Hmm, we thought we made that easy. Turned out nobody understood where the next step was. Uh, you, you look at the data around usage to understand where the problems are and to fix them. And when you create something new, you measure the value. And that's the that is the modern product model. Yeah, that, that's that's what we're doing. Uh, and you know, kind of like you take that to the you know the freemium land and expand this very iterative yes, product it, model. It's an interesting deviation. Like I said, I mean, for us, to tell you the truth, I mean, we do like monthly meetings with our with our customers bi biweekly when we first kick them off, but monthly just because of that feedback, right? Now we yeah. can go into their system and see all their clicks and, and analyze it. But sure. to tell you the truth, I mean, it's not, it's more than just generating that relationship. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, they, they will tell you things about why they didn't click. I mean, it is the most fascinating stuff in the universe. Totally. Um, and we're doing, we're working with one customer right now where, where he's asking for things we've never thought about. Like, Hey, give me the five top problems and this and that. And, but, but analytics, and engaging customers, I think, you know, because I'm thinking about this first one, I know that was the last question, but I, I rambled because it's, it's beer number two. Um, and this only was, it's 2% less alcohol. I, I That's the difference between the Imperials and the straight up pails, by the way. We go from the nine to 11 to the, the six to eight. But anyways. And then to the bourbon, but that's all right. Then to the bourbon, which is a little bit more than the six to eight. But I, I just start with the, the bourbon. Right. <laughs> Yeah, but, but it's interesting because the first question we started with on, on the series of questions, and when we chopped this up, in fact, anyway, I'm chopping it up this way, is, is we started talking about, hey, entrepreneurship, blah, blah, blah. And as we went through it, it seems that the common theme of entrepreneurship is, is customers, which is freaking obvious. Let's F-bomb it. I, I, I want to almost F-bomb it. It's so obvious, right? But it's obvious as hell, Rick, right? That you even said, you, like I said, you said three basic things, right? Our customers, our teams, and our pivot. And, and really, it seems like entrepreneurship, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, in the COVID world, is customers, right? I mean, it's it really is generating a relationship with the customers, caring about their problem, and solving their problem. And if you can't solve their problem, you can't convince them that they have that problem. I think that's the mental problem of a lot of people. Yeah. Well, that, that's a lot of sales. So, yeah. A lot of sales training used to be about convincing people that they had a problem, right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, kind of like, that's not what we're trying to do. You know, we we try to say, if you have this problem, try our software. It's free. Right? So, uh, and then, you know, then the relationship starts, right? So, uh, I don't know. It's an interesting, I mean, you could get into a whole conversation about, well, what about the problem they don't know they have and how do you build that in and solve for that? But is it worth your time? Really, is it? Now it becomes your time and your money, right? I think that's why I like your freemium model. They can chew it through their own brain, sleep at night, say, hey, now I get it. Now I need them, right? I mean, but but obviously we have a problem of, to tell you the truth, I mean, they, they've got to really understand how to implement EDR and, and technology. Like no. there is, there's a lot to security than just reviewing data. And a lot of people don't, it's overwhelming to them. Uh, analytics sure. by itself is mind boggling. I mean, I didn't even know till today, to tell you the truth, it wasn't even because of you, Rick. I'm like, what is this 
Microsoft BI thing, because to tell you the truth, Microsoft, keep, they've had so many different products. I can never keep track of Microsoft's most recent business analytic tool that they've got out there. Um, Power BI. You were on a board one time. I was sort of snickering when you, I, I can't imagine what, the, what that, that particular product was called at that time. Um, so, so listen, we're starting to to wind down now because we. And he's on, he's on his he's on his dragon milk. He's 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 down there. Now, the the thing I'd like to do is is go back, Rick. To uh, we talked about. Hey, I'm not a solution looking for a problem, right? I got to go figure out what that what that business problem is, and really for the business, not an IT problem and not a data analyst problem, but what's the business problem, right? That, that the customer needs help with. In that line of thinking, what are the top three business use cases that you're seeing across your customer set that's driving the adoption of your tool? Wow. Even with your one damn can, you should have asked that question like five hours. 10 ago. minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. So, <laughs> so it's all right. I'll, I'll give you an answer, right? So, so it, it's, it's about the, the cleanliness and the integration of data, right? So everybody's got multiple data sources. Uh, nobody's 100% certain the data is all actually clean, and it often isn't. And they always got to link it to other data, right? And so get it in, clean it, link it. And make it available to calculate. Yeah, those wraps on, Rick. Everybody has those problems. So now I've, I've heard you talk about sales, right? Using it and getting analysis and, and retail using it for this and that and, and stuff. So it really, I'm going to go back and visit that question again from a business case, not from an IT need to clean the business, right? I mean, to clean the data, but what is it that the business units are driving that demand that? these folks are reaching out to you for? It, it's all over the place. I mean, that's just the thing, right? Is that we're in insurance and financial services and healthcare and retail and consumer goods and hard manufacturing and the Army Corps of Engineers and the Census Bureau in Canada and Woolworths in Australia. And, you know, all these different companies all over the world uh, are using our stuff. And, you know, I, I gotta be honest with you, I don't even know some of the business questions they're answering, but I know they have to get data, land it. They have to make sure it's clean. They have to tie it together with other data and they have to have a simple way to calculate it. And then they have to provision it into some analysis. That journey for a combination of the analyst and the engineer is what we do. And uh, um, the actual analysis that they're performing for the business I just don't know what it is. I mean, I'm kind of cool about it. I know what it is for our retail and consumer goods companies because I spent a lot of time answering those questions. Sure. But I don't actually know what our insurance companies are doing with it. And you know what? They don't really want to tell us, right? They won't tell us what the business question is. They'll tell us that they have to link the data and what the problem of linking the data is. Sure. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, and they'll tell us that you know the engineer has this problem of collaborating with the business people. But, you know, we are, we are, you know, we're an engine room technology, right? You know, if you went in the engine room of a ship, uh, you know, the guy down we'll there bring with Al. He's doesn't good. necessarily <laughs> know, uh, you know, where the ship is going, you know, so, it's got to run I the engine. You. I hear you. And, and so the final question is, we really wind this down then, uh, just from a, hey, gee whiz, looking ahead. Do you see your tool being used uh, in the new field of uh, AI-based predictive analytics? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, you know, I use analytics as a term to describe everything from advanced AI machine learning to I've got to generate an analysis uh, for an executive who's answering me once a question answered. Right. Um, I think it's all analytics. Right. Um, I think right now a lot of the analytics is the business person answering the question, and you know we all think the the AI stuff is super sexy, but that's still a smaller piece of the pie. But whether you're trying to answer a business question for somebody like on what's the relation to COVID testing to my sales, or you're trying to predict the price of wheat in next year, or whatever, which requires some sophisticated model, you still have to acquire the data. Make sure it's clean, 
tie it to other data, and then put it into a format that you can calculate and provision it, right? So that's the engine room. Uh, we'll help you with that. Uh, whether it's an AI problem or a BI problem, you know, you name it, that's uh, that's our game. Awesome. I, I certainly right, appreciate Jeremy, man, you take it out. Yeah, I, I, I got one more question. Maybe it's a hard it. one. Take it out. Who do you compare yourself to in the industry? Right. Are, are you, are you, do you, or do you compete? I know you're partners with Tableau, but do you compete yeah. with them at some level? Do you compete with For Tableau? As a, do you compete with uh, the one that Google acquired? Was it Lookout or something like that? Yeah. So the, those tools like Tableau and Looker, they kind of sit at the far okay. end of the spectrum, right? We're kind of more in the middle. Uh, but um, I don't actually think about our competition. I mean, I do because everybody at, you know, everybody is focused on it. But I think if you get hung up on the other people you're competing with, you miss focusing on the customer. So I actually, you know, th there really isn't anybody approaching the problem of doing all five of these steps in one integrated way that connects the analyst and the engineers. There really isn't. Uh, there are people who are really super focused on the engineer. There are people who are really super focused on the analyst. Uh, there are people who are really super focused on integration of data. There's other people focused on cleanliness of data. There's like, you know, like making one simple journey that both of these roles can do together and collaborate. Like there's nobody else doing that. Right. And so I'm like, OK, well, I don't you know, that's fine. You know, maybe I'm wrong. But my customers seem to think that that's a really core problem for them. And we're going to focus on that. We're not going to worry about the other guy. Uh, you know, sure. uh, so, you know, I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's my answer. It's a great answer. Great. My, and, 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 great. To, and to close out, we have to always ask. So you spent some time in Bethesda. Yeah. Uh, are you a Capitals fan? Number one. And now that you've moved yeah. to Colorado, are you an Avs fan? And have you disavowed your loyalty to the Caps? No, you know, so, so I'm a Capitals fan. Uh, once upon a time, I was a Redskins fan. I'm willing to abandon the Redskins, not the Redskins, the Washington football team for the Broncos in a heartbeat, right? <laughs> but it's hard to not be a Caps fan because they're just, they have a cool culture, right? You know, they're doing it right, right? So I'm a Caps fan. I'm a Nats fan, right? I'm not sure I'm going to Nats for the Rockies, right? For the same reason, right? I love their kind of culture and, you know. The Rockies is a fun stadium. I have to tell you, buddy, I went to the Rockies stadium. It was amazing. It, yeah, I haven't, I have been, you know, so, no, it's, I don't know, it's, you know, the, uh, but the Nats stadium. stadium is pretty cool, right? You know, you got to love it there. Yeah, but, but you know what? So, so, so out of it, and, and Rick, I know we're ending on this whole thing here. Between the Kings, I, you know, I've never been, seen a Kings game outside of being in the Capitals and seeing the Kings play, right? Yeah. But um, yeah. I have to tell you, like, I've been to eight or nine NHL stadiums, but my favorite outside of, and I was going to call it the Verizon Center, right? They were the Cap Ones or whatever now, and, right? It has to be the Knights. Yeah. And, I, my I God, they so, have right. done in two or three years. I guess we're coming to year three right now. Oh, there you go. It was yeah. amazing job. Yeah. I mean, that the stadium rocks. The people in Vegas are incredibly wonderful people. But Absolutely. There's a reason why I cannot stand Philly, and it's not the stadium. Okay? Yeah. Sorry, Philadelphia. <laughs> the people in Vegas are wonderful people. They really are. Yeah. Um, Colorado, I tell you, the Colorado is the indoor lacrosse. They have, it's the greatest thing ever. It's the most so, so, so my daughter has just been accepted to the University of Denver, right? And, uh, uh, you know, they've got an awesome lacrosse program, right? So, and I played lacrosse in high school. She's not a lacrosse player. She's a swimmer. But the, uh, like, I can't wait to go down there and visit and, like, go watch a lacrosse game. You know, it, 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 and, and, and like I said, that was the, most, the best thing in Colorado besides the baseball is probably the indoor lacrosse. And then, like I said, Vegas, I, I don't know if I can handle the Raiders, but but dude, you know, Jeremy, listen, I'm a huge Caps fan, huge fan. Right. I came from Boston, but I'm a Caps fan. And uh, I it's can't hard not to like, them, right? You know, you like them because they're just like a kind of cool outfit, right? Well, the uh, Vegas was, was, was amazing about Vegas, and this has nothing to do with, like, we're going to get a cast here, and I can keep, keep on going, is, is you go there, and the people accept you. I, I saw a Buffalo's game, and, and 
these guys were giving shots to the Buffalo players. The Vegas fans were, were embracing the Buffalo fans just because they were visiting. And then they must be sick and They're, they're, they're contributing to the economy, of course. God, it was wonderful people. Wonderful. Right. Vegas has absolutely nothing in the universe except yeah. people that are there. I got to tell you, people are great. Absolutely. People are off. People yeah, are off. I, I can keep on going on. I, and, and, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing about diversity around this world today. Listen, I don't care. I love them all. It, it, I think that uh, I love my customers because, you know, they're, they're trying to do good for the most part. And, and you know what? When you get down to it, I, can, I enjoy, enjoy Vegas. Like I said, Kings, I just got to go visit. I'm not seeing the Kings. And, and the big one I want to see, I want to go see the Senders. I want to go to Vancouver. And I want to see the play in Vancouver. I mean, I don't know about you, Jeremy. Do you want to go up there? I, to watch a, a game in Canada would be yeah. amazing. I'd love to do the whole, like this coming season, if they actually allowed fans, it's eight teams in Canada, or the, all the Canadian teams can only play each other the whole time, right? So you go from Vancouver to the Battle of Edmonton, right? You go to Alberta, Wonderful. Calgary. It's, it's amazing. I, I was in, you know, 10 year no. 20 years ago, I had a customer in Toronto and I saw a hockey game there. The, you know, the main Leafs play. Oh yeah. That was the most amazing thing. You know, like that was an experience. Well, and, yeah. Listen, on that note, we've got to wind down. So, okay. Uh, boo. Boo. Now, you're, 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 that's it. Now you're off the show. And Chris and I, <laughs> listen, thank you so much for spending the time with yes. us. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Uh,